This is Think Like a Genius. Tread the line of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, persuasion, and so much more than gray matter. Let's dive in as we fall into a world of intrigue. And now, Think Like a Genius with your host, Lance Vantanar. Right. Thank you for coming on to Thinking Like a Genius podcast. I was actually quite surprised when you reached out to me uh, with your interest because uh, you are a business consultant uh, based on what you do on a day-to-day basis. Uh, On uh, the the discussion that we've had, you've spoken about getting things done and also your, your own approaches and your methodologies when it comes to businesses and actually analyzing problems and looking at uh, problems uh, in your own approach to them. So the purpose of the podcast is actually to explore that topic a bit more in detail and actually give people a different insight on how you approach things, how you, uh, how you came about your, your approach and your thought processes and your mindset that when it comes to actually the getting, thing, uh, getting things done approach. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the, the, thank you for having me, first of all, uh, Lance, uh, it's great to be here. And what I, what I tend to help people understand is that getting things done is just about that. It's a methodology for being able to integrate your world in different disparate pieces mm-hmm. and uh, learning how to productively organize your world. Uh, whereas what I have noticed over the past 20, 25 years of really being steeped in the personal productivity space, which is time, team, task, project, and energy management. You name the the areas of personal performance that we need to really understand. I I came to this understanding that I think people don't know how to actually get better at getting better. And the the whole notion that we don't actually get taught how to optimize is a problem. It's a, it's a fundamental productivity problem. And how could, what did I learn in the process of, I've read over 400 books on the topic. I've, I've really been steeped in the material for so long. I was just curious, what did I learn from all of this? And so I started to put my thoughts down. And what I started to see as a pattern were these kind of four fundamental pillars of how people get more done. And uh, and, and so that's how getting more done was really born, was this whole notion of looking at the underlying research, you know, what we've learned both in science, but both in the, uh, you know, general conversations, people's experiences of using various personal productivity methodologies, as well as trying different techniques and tactics. And you know, this is the culmination of that is getting more done is my kind of my thought basis around um, how people can be more productive by getting more done than just organizing their things so that they can get things done. Uh, And so I'm a GTD practitioner. I love getting things done in the getting things done methodology, but I am someone who very much believes that there is a a place where we need to actually learn how to optimize our world so that we're able to uh, learn how to get better at getting better. So that's where it all came from. Diving into the initial patterns or the initial things that you started seeing the first thing obviously that comes across is that you raise the question as you know what can be done better the the other thing is actually starting to identify the 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 patterns because if the the, the process is you ask the question then you start looking for potential answers and you start almost breaking down the problem into its uh, component parts how did you start looking for the patterns? What were the indicators for you that you were starting to see uh, on a regular basis that started making you think, okay, this is, this is something that can be identified and broken down and improved and understood to actually then conceptualize it and, and start making changes? Yeah, I, I come at everything as a skeptic, I mean, as a healthy uh, skeptic. <laughs> and so thinking about the various productivity methodologies that I hear consistently bandied about on the internet, just, you know, generally, mm-hmm. um, and of course, across the many books that I was reading, I have been just keeping a, a, a clear 
set of notes in terms of what I felt was working or not working about the various methodologies in terms of just, they're just not validated by science or they are anecdotal. So someone uses themselves as a guinea pig and, uh, and you know, tests this framework out and it works for them. And so, woohoo, it should work for everybody. <laughs> and that's just not how I operate. And so I kept looking at, okay, well, if someone has experienced this and they're saying that many others have experienced this, uh, how, how valid is that piece of data? How, mm-hmm. how, how useful is that to everyone else? And so uh, I just, I've just been keeping uh, notes on how I've seen people in my own world who have said, oh, well, you know what, I've, uh, I really want to try out this productivity methodology. And so they would, they would try it out. And, and then I would ask them three, six months later, uh, hey, are you still using that? And if they aren't, then that's just a, another data point for me. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not, that's not necessarily you know, validated by, by anything scientific. But as I said, there's kind of two sides to this. There's the, the, what we know right now from scientific research and then what we don't know, which we fill in with anecdotes and with you know folks uh, experiencing out there in the wild and giving back their um, their experiences that way and uh, so I've just been keeping heavy notes in terms of what I've seen working and not working and as a I keep harping on this notion but that I've, I've been using getting things done for so long that I've always noted the parts of getting things done that were that needed to be modified for me. And what I realized that they weren't actually things about getting things done. They were actually things that were about optimizing life generally that helped me get more done. And so that was, that was really the whole process was just kind of sitting back. And every time I saw a new productivity methodology thinking, what were the good parts of this? What parts could be validated? Uh, What parts could be utilized well? And what parts didn't make sense at all. Like they just really didn't make sense. And, and they are being said because people like to hear them, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just like uh, developing habits are good. Uh, you know, like habits are, are not good or bad. Habits are just a, a psychological phenomenon, right? They are just automaticity. Uh, yeah. So, so this idea of building good habits or bad habits um, ends up being this common, uh, you know, kind of vernacular. And, um, and it, ends up, I think, harming people in the sense that we strive to, to build habits as opposed to actually doing the things that help us get more done, uh, which is focusing on our routines. Um, and so mm-hmm. it's one of those a- areas where I, I really found myself consistently in conflict with some of the people who are very popular in productivity right now who are constantly harping on how to build habits and how to develop habits well. And it may be a terminology issue for me solely, which is the fact that focusing on something that's really tough, that's really difficult for people to be able to manifest, uh, is not going to be the best way for people to actually get more done. If they focused on their routines, the things that are the, the lattice work of their days, then they're actually going to be able to optimize better using the infrastructure that already exists, that we know scientifically exists, then the habit part ends up being this secondary piece because we're, we're thinking about behaviors as opposed to this Uh, achievement, this attainment of a goal that doesn't actually exist. Building a habit is not something that you uh, get to the end of the habit and it just, you've reached the mountain. Uh, Habits are things that you develop them and they come and go. Uh, And uh, we don't particularly uh, strive for building a habit. Habits just develop. And so they're a byproduct. So why don't we focus on the actions that we can take to be able to do good things throughout our day to optimize and again, I think this is semantic in some sense, but I think it's actually also fundamentally how human how humans behave. And so, to kind of uh, close out on your question, is you know I, I've just been paying attention to these very um, I think thoughtful dialogues that have been happening in the productivity space, and I think mm-hmm. this is part of the maturation of uh, say industry and uh, just paying attention to how people are uh, really um, developing processes that actually help people and uh, using the underlying uh, research that we have and watching and paying attention to how people actually implement them are, are really uh, the two pieces that I've been paying attention to in order to develop it. Okay. That's, that's a really interesting approach for me because although I've looked into habit development and habits as a, a, as a, 
you could almost say a psychological construct to actually understand how habit has developed and how people implement habits and actually develop a, a useful habit or a useful process to actually achieve a result. It's probably a better way of putting it rather than a habit because habits can be really difficult because people see a habit as something that they want to want to achieve, but it's really difficult to implement. But taking your lead on the point is actually taking a look at the process and actually implementing a process will lead to a habit. If you, yeah. if you build out a process that's one fits into what you do already and just building it out and making it part of your daily process, because then the consequence is a habit. Correct. That, and, and yeah, it ends up being a, a, a people tend to try and look at a habit as an individual construct that they can build mm -hmm. when in reality it's built in the context of the space in which they exist. And so it, it's just, it's looking at the tree instead of the forest and there's a system in place. We, you know, it's a systems design problem in essence. Mm -hmm. We, we have systems that are running around us. We have uh, spouses and children and uh, homes that we need to manage uh, and jobs that we need to go to. And in all of that, is where and how our habits lie and develop. So as we're focused so much on this one particular habit, we're actually losing where we can optimize, which is the overarching patterns that we move around the day in. And if we can actually use that, shift the parts of our day so that we're actually more optimal on that level, then the habits naturally develop. The things that we want to happen will then become a part of it. And so I just, I, I fundamentally don't believe that there are uh, good habits or bad habits that need to be focused on more. We need to be focused on the routines that are happening and those habitual behaviors that tie the routines together, right? So we can actually almost say that the habits build the routines, but if we focus on the routines, the habits all fall in line, right? They, they are, they're followers and the routines are the leaders. And if we focus on leadership, on that level, then the other parts start to fix themselves. And there are obviously, there, there's some uh, um, gray area there, right? You know, you might decide you want to drink a glass of water every morning uh, when you wake up. It's totally fine. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely uh, behavior to, to, to do. Um, if you want more hydration in your life, fine. Um, but what does that have to do with the overarching, you know, uh, routine in your life? And, figuring those pieces out help you to really understand how to optimize well. And so people tend to really think um, uh, in, the, in the very granular sense about a habit. And mm -hmm. what they're losing is the context of how much more productive they could be if they could understand the routine level. So it's, I, I, would, I would take a step back and say that I'm not I'm not against habits. I'm just for routines, right? And, and I think that the more people focus on routines, the more they're going to get out of it. And I think a lot more people focus on these little individual habits, thinking that they're going to provide them with the most benefit. And I believe actually that when you optimize on the routine level, you're going to get the most benefit on the, on the routine level than on the, on the individual habit level. You've come up with some really interesting aspects, which I think starts, this is where things get really interesting. Uh, it's almost like based on, on the discussion we're having over here is that habit is almost like a top down approach, trying to change things almost from the outside. It's almost like, you know, using a habit to try and change something uh, and trying to change something from the outside in where it's a lot easier to change something from the inside out, which means it's almost like you're trying to make a change on the exterior to implement a change on the interior where it's, it's like, for example, hoping to wash a car and going to think it's going to make the car run better. Where in essence, what you've got to do is actually work on the engine and the motor and the mechanics, which will make the car run better because you're actually working on the functional components and the process as a whole, which is going to implement a better, better functioning car. Now, if you take that a step further, and you apply systems thinking to it, uh, which is a really interesting concept where I think it ties into what, what you are talking about is that systems thinking is where instead of looking at the individual components 
and trying to tweak in each individual component to get the best out of it, you've got to take a look at how the whole system functions and see which ones you can improve at each part that's going to give you an overall improvement and get you the result that you want. Because if you take a look at the, uh, as you mentioned, the whole, all of your processes and your actions and your, and your, your, your activity over a day, uh, making adjustments where you need to in what your daily pattern is, is going to be a lot easier than trying to introduce something from externally because you're trying to almost force something into, uh, into your day, which you not actually have capacity for because it doesn't fit into your pattern of processing. Uh, there is a good example where somebody says, uh, I'm trying to think who, who it was that uh, does a systems thinking videos. I've got them uh, on my archive, somebody, I'll, uh, I'll share that in the, in the uh, show notes afterwards, is giving the analogy of a car. So if you take a look at a car, you've got the frame, you've got the wheels, you've got the gearbox, you've got the suspension, you've got the engine, and the engine is broken down into its components. You've got combustion, you've got the um, you know, radiator, you've got your, your engine oil, you've got the, you know, you've got the fuel. If you just optimize one aspect of it, you could actually be causing problems with other parts of the car. Now, if you take the car apart and you Im implement or put in a different engine, it might not necessarily actually work for that car because it doesn't fit into the car as a whole. You've got to make sure whatever you replace it with is actually going to fit into the whole system for the system to actually work. And that's where systems thinking, I think, fits into your uh, approach where you've got to take a look at your whole system of, uh, of your processes, your patterns, and everything else you do on a day-to-day -day basis and see how it fits into your system of behavior, your system of processes, your your day-to-day -day use activities. And if you slot it into your day-to-day -day activities and it fits in seamlessly, then that's going to work for you because you're going to get a result out of it. Have you come across systems thinking before? I have, yeah. And and this is you're you're talking exactly my language in terms of how I think about these uh, these different productivity approaches, which is that if they if they're trying to uh, somehow supplement a system that was already operating, then they're going to get rejected. It's mm. it's kind of like, I, I tend to think of that's from biological systems, but if you swap out an organ, it has a high likelihood of rejection without a lot of massaging, right? They mm. use anti-rejection uh, drugs. They, they have to find someone who is highly compatible with you from a blood type perspective and all these other, uh, you know, analyses. Um, and our, our systems are highly complex. Our biology is highly complex. And to just replace an organ is not as easy as, it, as you would think. You just can't swap out anyone's you know, liver for someone, someone else's liver. And when we, when we try to do that, we get a high level of rejection. And I'm not saying that there aren't outliers. There are people out there who <laughs> will take uh, my advice on doing one particular tactic and they'll go with it and they'll you know, they will, they will be very hard line approach about it and they will doggedly do that thing. But what I've found over the large course of time is that the vast majority of people are working within their systems and it's very difficult to replace parts of their systems with other parts of their systems as it relates to habit. Habit's just not, it just doesn't seem to be the vehicle that's most useful for people uh, because it tends it tends to be trying to use a hammer to take out a screw, mm. and uh, and it just ends up being very very difficult for people. So if we can if we can understand the approaches of how to how to uh, assess a situation and understand the right way to make it better, right? Not just to do things and organize it, right? I can. I can organize my tasks in all kinds of really wonderful ways, but actually learning how to optimize getting them done, that's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's mm. where we actually understand physics and fiction, friction, right? Mm. Um, so the, the goal here is to understand the systems in place uh, as opposed to these individual granular techniques that may get you a little bit of, of productivity here and there, but it's really not going to ultimately provide you with a, a, a holistic approach to getting more done. How do you go about actually identifying 
how to start implementing something like that because you you're talking about a lot of quite a complex systems and behaviors that people have on a day to day basis even though people think oh i'm just going this i'm just doing that everything else is you know they they're so used to doing these things and it becomes easy for them in their day to day patterns of 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 work how do you actually look at the their 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 whole system or their whole system of working behavior everything else and then identifying how you can actually add or optimize or improve to actually get the result that the, uh, that the person wants out of it. Sure. So it's it's probably good to explain to people a little bit more about the getting more done framework itself. So yeah. it it is uh, it is designed on really four principles. Uh, one is focus. Focus mm-hmm. is is actually split into two different parts: goal orientation and then literal attention, our ability to attend to a specific thing at a time. Uh, so that one is a one is a a a type of skill which is planning and the other skill is being able to well it's really planning and prioritizing right because you need to be able to to goal orient you need to be able to not only identify future goals forecast what you want to get done uh, but then you also have to choose a limited number of those because you can't do everything Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's about choosing so focus is one side and the other side is attention so that's a its own pillar right is is focus uh the next is understanding our 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 whole world of, um, of routines, right? So what we were talking about earlier of what's the scaffolding of our life and how do we actually optimize the scaffolding? If you wanna be a better uh, parent, uh, well, you may actually decide that part of being a better parent is optimizing the time you have with your children as opposed to trying to uh, you know, persuade them to be better humans, uh, you can, you can actually say, well, you know what, I spend this time with my kids. And most of the time, it's administrative and makes uh, for there to be a a kind of a lot of conflict in that time, say the morning breakfast routine, Uh, the kids come down for breakfast, and all of this, you know, chaos is happening. If we can optimize that routine, then there's less stress on you, which means you're going to be a better human. So you'll be modeling being a better human for your children, who hopefully will then be better humans. Um, so it's these kinds of, of systems that we can look at throughout our day. So that's the routine part. Then we talk about motivation uh, and specifically accountability. Uh, and so again, I've just been paying attention to the literature for many, many years and motivation is actually based on uh, challenge and accountability. Uh, I focus mostly on the, uh, the notion of uh, how people can be accountable to one another or themselves, right? We have self-accountability, we have one-to-one accountability, group accountability, and then public accountability. And, uh, and so I focus on what levels and stages of accountability people need in order to be most productive. Uh, and then finally, organizing, organizing things uh, so that we can take action. Uh, and that's really where all of the other productivity methodologies, they really fit into that space. Getting things done, bullet journal, you name the productivity methodology, and they're all really about organizing your tasks. They're about putting them into the right places and having the right paper or the right app or otherwise to be able to get yourself organized in that sense. Uh, but it's about organizing tasks and projects. And so, uh, so those are the four fundamental pillars focus, then routine, uh, accountability, and organization. And, uh, and so when we think about all of those pieces, then we think about, well, how does someone actually get started in this approach? How does somebody actually look to figuring out what to do? Uh, and so focus is the first part. You have to decide what area of your life you either feel the most pain, that is you have the most discomfort in, in, your, in, your, in that particular area of life, and you can focus on just that sliver of your life in order to be able to optimize it. You learn how to get better by focus skills mastery. And the whole idea behind focus skills mastery is that you focus on the skills that you develop in this particular area of your life in order to get better. And so you can start to optimize routines by limiting your development time to this one particular area of your life. The rest of your life is going to continue doing what it's doing. You're not pausing any particular part of your life, but you're just putting a little bit more energy to highly optimize this area of your life so that you can get better at getting better. And, uh, and that's what helps you get more done. And so what happens is you go through this process, right? You decide, okay, I'm going to focus on this one goal, which is to get better at this particular area. And so I'm going to choose to optimize this routine. Say it's my morning routine. Maybe it's my uh, my routine when I show up at work every day, how do I really get 
into action when I start my day? Do I spend too much time at the, the, the water cooler or at the coffee machine uh, chit-chatting uh, with mates? Or am I, uh, am I capable of sitting down and really getting into the best work when I know that I, that's my optimal time to be getting things done? Um, so we, we go ahead and we optimize that particular routine. Uh, then we step back and we say, okay, if I'm not capable of doing this myself, which is, again, optimizing routine, being self-accountable is one way to do it. We then use other uh, you know, uh, uh, levers of motivation, which is uh, one-to-one accountability. We might find a peer at, at, my, at the office uh, to be able to help me uh, optimize my morning work routine. I could find a group of people, right? I could hold a meeting if I were a manager uh, or, or someone who um, was able to get a group of people together and say, listen, I need to optimize this part of my routine. Uh, I need you all to come and be a part of, of that accountability to make me uh, make sure that I'm doing this, making sure the, the team is doing this. Um, and then uh, we can also step it up a level and make it a public accountability thing. You could announce to the entire company, every morning I'm going to do my report on X and, uh, and, and I'm going to publish that report uh, by X time. And so we can use these levers of accountability. There are other forms of motivation, of course, uh, but I'm just saying that the most you know, readily available one to people is accountability and tends to work best. And then finally, it's organizing, right? So the notion here is that what do you need to do? What are the, what are the tools? What are the, what are the pieces of technology that you need to make that thing come together? How do you organize the pieces? So maybe you need uh, the right software to produce the report. You need the right data. Uh, maybe you need uh, the right people to get information. You need to be able to get those pieces together. How do we optimize those parts so that you can flow through the activity as quickly and as efficiently as possible? And so that's, that's the whole process of getting more done is really optimizing at each of those levels so that we're able to understand where we're going and then make the, the quickest way to developing it. And uh, it's, it's funny because it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, when, you're, when you optimize on that level, there is no uh, necessarily any um, specific um, time orientation with it. But what we find is that if you focus on this one particular area, all the other areas of your life benefit from you doing this one particular skills mastery exercise. And so you may be focused on, on a work routine but lo and behold, your, your morning routine or your, your evening routine or other parts of your, your world, there are lots of different types of routines that we have, um, end up becoming better by virtue of you learning how to focus, optimize in one particular area, motivate yourself in the right ways to get that done, and organizing that material in such a way that it makes sense to the activities necessary. Those are skills that you learn that actually translate to any, any area of your life. So it's really funny because once you start the activity of any particular focus skills mastery exercise, um, they kind of bleed over into other parts of your world uh, because it's just natural that we actually start to model the activities and the parts that work well for us in the first place. What's the most difficult part for people when they start implementing the, the process when they, when they go through this? Because obviously, what you doing now is that you you are introducing a certain amount of disruption to a person's life and, and what they're doing on a day to day basis. So the I, the the obvious points that you mentioned over there is obviously there's got to be a very strong uh, driver for them to want to change something because unless the 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 emotional driver and the, and the, and the need is there, <clears throat> people are not going to want to change having a yeah, kind of need to get something done is never going to work. Um, all of the things that I've looked at for my own personal life and also speaking with other people, <clears throat> for them to actually get actual benefit out of it and actually self-motivate and actually really have the energy to actually go with it, there has to be a really strong negative driver to say, look, I don't like this. I really need to change this. I need to now focus on this because now I've got a button down. I need to see how I can make the changes. So the, I find that the, the, the driver is really important. You've got to have a really strong emotional driver to actually get you almost onto that first stage of, of implementing the first action. 
but as you've said, is, is actually focusing on all the component parts to actually provide the positive feedback loops and to provide the, the, for the motivation to build is the other key component because you, for, for a person to then see the benefit out of it, they need to get a, a response out of the activities that they're doing. They need to be able to gauge yes or no. Is that a positive or a negative feedback loop? Is it helping me or is it not helping me? Which part is, is actually giving me the benefit? So the, the, the feedback is really important for them to assess whether it's working or not working. Um, and then obviously over a period of time you talk about the accountability and making sure that you're actually answering for the actions and that gives you a way of actually tracking your your progress and your behavior and that's a way of actually building in the self-regulation and the, in, in the whole aspect so do you coming back to the question was what do you think people get stuck on most when they start implementing a change like that yeah, I think it's focus. Uh, people have a very difficult time choosing the one area in their life that they want to affect change in. Mm -hmm. And my answer to them is that they could flip a coin and it really wouldn't make a difference. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that uh, is, is actually um, well-founded in the sense that, as I said before, once you start to learn how to actually focus on a skill and master it, that is once you look at a particular type of activity in your routine that requires optimization and you learn how to optimize there, you start to actually figure out how to optimize in other parts of your life very quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. the, the road to success in optimizing your world in terms of getting more done is actually not that difficult to understand once, you, once you've felt the the muscles, the mental muscles working to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I think most people have a difficulty choosing that first thing to go down. Mm -hmm. And what I tend to th tell people to do is actually, instead of using the, the fear-based side of this, which is how much pain I feel, if they have struggle there, then I actually have them flip it, which is to look toward a, a pleasure perspective, which is what's the thing that's gonna provide you the most joy, the most excitement um, by virtue of this thing happening? So they're, they're, it's about possibility as opposed to about overcoming some kind of um, internal feeling of limitation. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you approach a project as being, I'm not good enough, so I'm trying to make myself better, that's a very different mindset than I'm already whole, I'm already um, great the way I am, and I want to make myself better. I want to make myself even better than that. Uh, that level of performance enhance, enhancement, um, that level of, you know, uh, um, mindset shift um, ends up being very, very positive for the person and, uh, and actually is more motivating, I think, on the other side of that. So if we, can, if we can choose something where it's actually going to provide them with a greater benefit on the other side that is uh, positive oriented, then they're going to they're gonna be more likely to both uh, be able to choose something that is uh, more, I want to say interesting, but just more fun for them generally, pleasurable for them generally. And uh, they will learn the skills anyway. And that, mm -hmm. will then, that will then backflow in terms of benefit to all of their other systems uh, because they've learned the, the, the skills, the muscles to be able to do it. Uh, I tend to use the, uh, the paradigm of our biological needs uh, to be able to help kind of explain this, uh, which is to say that if you are going to use getting more done to lose weight, that's not probably going to be very useful to you because that's not how your system works, right? Your, your, your biology is not designed to quote unquote lose weight. It doesn't care what weight you are. It cares about optimal operation. So that requires you to not just think about your um, physique um, or your um, heart you know, um, heart health, it's all of those things together, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're high anxiety and you have heart issues, then you're much more likely to die of some kind of cardiac disease, right? You know, it's like, this is just, it's just biology. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to, we need to consider all of these pieces, again, thinking about the gestalt of your, of your, of your biology, as opposed to this one individual piece. And so again, if we think about how to optimize in these various parts, then we can start to get better at getting better. So you then need to think, okay, well, how's my sleep? How's my nutrition? 
how is my uh, my physical exercise, right? Strength, flexibility, endurance. Mm-hmm. How is my uh, how is my social relations? How am I dealing with emotion management? How am I dealing with my mental health as well? Uh, and so on and so forth. And all of those pieces are really focus mastery exercises that need to be dealt with, right? They are they are projects unto themselves that once you start learning how to say get your sleep in order right sleep is a a fundamental component of our overall productivity once we start getting our sleep in order then other parts of our life start to clean up themselves as well the most difficult thing though is to say okay i'm not going to focus on my nutrition right now because i know that they're connected right i know that my if I, if I eat less, if I take in less calories, then I'm going to have, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to have less, um, you know, less fat being developed, you know, body fat being developed uh, by eating less calories. But the reality is, is that you need to choose for you the best part. Like if you really love sleep, then get your sleep in order, you know, enjoy the process of, of, of learning how to optimize your sleep. And then by learning that process, you can then stand on the shoulders of your success and go ahead and say, okay, now that I've tackled this really um, pleasurable part of my life, right? Now let me go ahead and see how I can optimize my routines as it relates to eating. Because again, we eat based on the structure of our day, right? We eat based on all of these cues throughout our day that are, are our routines that lead us to eat good you know, well or eat poorly, basically good nutrition or bad nutrition. And, uh, you know, and, and that's the part that we have to really figure out. But really, from my perspective, I would deal with sleep before I would deal with nutrition. Because the reality is, is that if you are not sleeping well, you are likely going to eat poorly, because there's all kinds of parts of your routine uh, that are now um, shifting based on your circadian rhythm. Uh, so your met- metabolism is being messed with um, by virtue of poor sleep. So if we get the foundation in place of sleep, then that's great. Now, I'm not a sleep psychologist, nor am I a medical professional, so <laughs> that's not my job to give that kind of advice. Um, but I'm just saying that you know we, we tend to think about these things um, from our own limited view. And once we start to understand the, the science behind these, we can start to make better choices about how we deal with our systems, how we deal with our routines, without getting wrapped up in the uh, fad diet or the trend diet, you know, now I need to do a detox or, or a, a juice cleanse uh, to be able to get my beach body ready for the summer. Those, those things are kind of nonsense. Uh, when if we just focused on the real fundamentals of how we live and how systems work together, we can start to get actually much better at getting better. I think you've highlighted a lot of really valid points as one understanding the, the systems as a whole. Two, also taking, I think a, a very big part of it is also taking a lot of personal responsibility for your own activities, your own decisions, your own life, and actually realizing I make these decisions, but they are based on my pattern of life. I, I, I'll go back to sleep because it's a, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting area which there is a lot of research which is, uh, which is coming up, which proves that one sleep is absolutely vital one it's good for brain health two it 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 helps the body go through this various sleep cycles it helps the brain clear out a lot of toxins and flushes out a lot of uh you could say byproducts of 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 a day's active thinking and doing a lot of active uh, thought process work and doing its day-to-day things uh, your body goes through all of these sleep processes for it to almost reset it and actually refresh it, which then feeds into providing you with, uh, <clears throat> you could say, excuse me, <clears throat> the mental reserves to actually wake up the next day and actually start taking an action because now you're rested, you feel refreshed, and you actually feel more, more motivated to take the, the step or to make a change or to get up and actually get on with your day. So it, it, it's, a, it's a good way of starting off your process of making any kind of changes in your day. Tying it back to nutrition, if you are tired or you've not slept enough and everything else, your body needs energy to fuel itself or your brain needs energy because it needs to stay awake. It needs to drive the biggest user of energy. So what happens is you eat food, which has got a lot of high calories, but the 
the issue with that is it doesn't necessarily have really good nutrition. So although you're eating really sugary foods, high calorific foods, it's not always the best choice of foods because now what you're doing is that, yes, you're getting the calories to provide you with the energy to deal with it. But now you start playing havoc with all of your energy levels and how that body processes any energy and, and processes and deals with it, which means you're, if you're relying a lot of sugar, your body crashes then after the initial uh, sugar rush that you've got. Now what you do is you start feeding yourself more sugar, you start feeding yourself a lot more of this really poor nutritious food to give you that energy to actually cope with it and you start getting into the cycle. Now that there's a bunch of knock-on effects that it has, it starts getting really complicated and everything else. But that's a, that's a really good example of actually showing that just by not optimizing or paying careful attention and actually being diligent in getting a good structure in your day, uh, it can have a knock-on effect on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on various other parts of, of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So do you also find that structure plays a really big part in actually getting things done and actually getting the processes to work and getting the, the, the biggest change in people? Yeah. So, so you know, I, as I said, the, the fourth and final pillar of getting more done is organizing, right? How to take action. And that really is about the uh, structure. How do, you, how do you frame whatever you're trying to change so that you have the right tools uh, in place to make that happen? And uh, tools tend to be organizing skills and some level of technology, whether that's paper and pen or your smartphone and apps. It doesn't really make any difference. Uh, the point is, is that at that at that point, um, having good structure in place is actually fundamental to to making sure that happens. So it may be to in in my case, I tend to think that data tracking is the number one tool to being able to um, start any process, and that's mm -hmm. all within the organizing space. Which is, you don't know what's wrong until you know what's wrong, mm -hmm. and uh, you need data to be able to understand that. So. Most people will uh, shirk at this because they don't want to keep track of data. They don't want to do the manual work of keeping track of data. Thankfully, there's really great technology today that helps us track all kinds of things mm. uh, for and about our uh, our world. So if you want to track what you're doing, there's tools like Rescue Time that basically analyzes all of the things you're doing on your computer or your phone and can then give you reports on how you spend your time on your devices, uh, you can keep a piece of paper and pen and you know a little uh, ledger uh, book and keep tra track of how you spend your day. You can track how you spend money by looking at your bank accounts. Uh, you can you can do a lot of data tracking without you actively doing that manual mm -hmm. uh, data analysis, data entry. Uh, but uh, the point is is that you have to look at some of the data, and that requires a system that requires some structure. That means you have to be using something that gives you the data to be able to. Uh, analyze and uh, reflect upon at some point. So there's one part of that, that the active and passive uh, tracking process. Then there are the next steps, which is, do I have all of the resources in the right places so that my routines work for me? So having your gym clothes in the garage with your running shoes and you want to go running in the morning, well, Maybe that's not the best place <laughs> to have mm. your, your gym clothes or your running clothes if you're trying to get yourself uh, to go running in the morning. Maybe you want to put them on a chair next to, your, uh, next to your, your door so that you can go right to the door of your bedroom, put on your, your gym clothes, uh, put on your running shoes, and uh, head out for a jog. Uh, it's about making the organization of your space and the triggers that help you get those things uh, done uh, best optimized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, people tend to think about this from the perspective of uh, just getting things done. And I care more about how do we actually aggregate these pieces so that they're, they're most efficient and most effective together. And so that really does require some, some deep level thinking about how am I actually moving throughout my day? Do I normally get up out of bed and go to the bathroom uh, and then go to the kitchen? Or do I normally uh, get up from bed and immediately go and open up my blinds? to let some of the sunshine in. Um, if that's the case, well, that, that little bit of data gives us a lot of information about how you actually operate because maybe we want to put the clothes next to the window where you're naturally going to gravitate. That's a well-worn path in your brain to go walk toward the shades and open them up, right? Uh, or maybe we then put the clothes on your, uh, your uh, basin 
in the bathroom because you know that you're going to go to the bathroom. Uh, you go to the bathroom, there goes your clothes, and then we have less friction uh, to getting your clothes on because heck, you're right there. The clothes are right there and you can put them on. Uh, you can actually reduce that even further by saying, you know what, I'm going to put my clothes on before I go to bed. I'm going to sleep in my gym clothes. Uh, and that's going to make me get up in the morning and I'm going to go to the restroom. And then guess what? I'm already in my gym clothes. So now I can go, <laughs> go for a jog, right? It's, it's about understanding how you actually operate already. And we can put in these minor you know, uh, behavioral modifications, these behavioral interventions that then help us be able to get better at getting better. And so it's about optimizing in this way that I think people tend to think, oh, I've got to build a habit of, of going for a run. Um, but in reality, it's, you know, all of this uh, self-denigration, I'm not motivated enough to go for a run. I don't, I don't care about myself enough. And all of this negative internal self-speak, when in reality, it's just those little tiny triggers that help us to be able to get ourselves moving, but that really help, but, but not understanding our routine, not understanding how we actually operate throughout the day is, is really powerful. You know, my, yeah. my normal operating mo modality is that I typically leave my phone. I don't touch my phone in the morning as a mechanism of reward. I leave my phone on my side table, which is my alarm clock. Uh, so it, it alarms. I get up in the morning and I don't actually look at anything on the phone. I get up and I go to the restroom and then I brush my teeth and, um, and then I'm allowed to pick up my phone. And that little routine in the morning, right? It's just a little minor routine, but it helps me get, get distance between um, the world and myself, right? Mm -hmm. I get a chance to look out at the sun, uh, see what the weather is, um, enjoy the world for a moment and pause and just take it all in and then I can open up my phone and then start to look at, well, what's going on in the world? Uh, what's, mm. my next, what's my first appointment and all of the other things? Now, for some people, they want, they want to not look at their phone for the first X number of hours of their day and that kind of thing. I'm not that kind of person. I'm, I don't feel my world is any worse off because I looked at my phone in the morning. Um, I don't particularly check my email in the morning. Uh, so that's a, a whole nother argument and an, another uh, kind of discussion for another day. But I do love being able to check the news and, and check out what's going on and understanding what my day is going to look like. And, uh, and so that's my little reward for getting up and doing that little routine, which is mm. getting a, kind of that, that moment of solitude in my day, that little pause between by the time I'm done brushing my teeth and then uh, picking up my phone, just taking a moment and just taking in the world, being grateful for being alive another day uh, and those kinds of things. And, um, and, and so there is this tug of understanding the structures that we have in place and the tools that we're using to be able to make those things happen and the reward associated with it. And reward is a, is a very, um, is a, is a, a clumsy word, uh, but we need to use um, some levels of understanding our internal and external rewards for intrinsic and extrinsic motivation yeah. to be able to, to make these things happen. And so I um, particularly appreciate uh, one um, kind of my inner world. I'm, I'm a, I'm a happy inner world person. And so I know that, that, that's an intrinsic motivation to have that closed internal space to be happy and to be, and to be um, whole in that space. So that little, it's usually 10, 15 seconds in the morning is, is a sacred space to me. It is a very, very powerful time for me in my day. And that as a reward um, is kind of uh, as a, as a, it's not a reward. It's a, it's a, it's a place for me in my day that I've created space for it in my day is very powerful for me. And it's a driving uh, piece of how I, how I look at my routine, right? My routine wouldn't be as useful to me if I didn't put that little bit of optimization in there and notice yeah. that the optimization is actually taking time to, for something that anyone else maybe would think is unproductive, but is very productive for me because it recharges and refreshes me. Mm -hmm. and a good time of my day. So don't think that that productivity is always just getting more done in less time. It's about doing the things that are really going to make your life better. And optimizing getting more done is truly getting the right things done for you. Yeah. And many people forget that, that, you know, spending time deciding that you're going to spend uh, three hours in the evening with your family to watch a movie. That is not unproductive time. If, if you planned to do it and yeah. that it serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. So we need to really start thinking about getting more done, uh, more than just getting uh, more things done in less time. Yeah, I think you've, you've highlighted a, a lot of very crucial uh, things. Um, 
I'm going to take my own example. When I, when I got back to exercising more on a regular basis, one of the biggest challenges was actually identifying the correct time for me to actually start exercising because I didn't like the evenings because it was way too busy. Uh, to uh, I like the solitude of the morning. So I decided to, yeah, I wanted to do it in the morning. So what I did is actually I pre-packed my bags the night before. I put it all on the front door. So the first thing I did, I get up in the morning, as you gave an example, I would go and brush my teeth, wash, uh, freshen up, get dressed into my gym clothes. And then I would go directly to the gym because my bag's already packed with work clothes in and everything else is down at the door. Once I've walked my dog, I've got to, I've got to the next step of actually going to the gym, which means the process is I've, I've keyed my day to actually get to the next goal of actually getting to the gym. And because there's no choice of do I have to, do I want to go to the gym? The process is there. I get up, I get dressed into gym clothes. I know I've got my, my, my structure is already pre-decided, which means you don't have a procrastination issue because you're not trying to make the decision. Do I have to? It's like I'm going to the gym in the morning, which means your day is optimized to do that. And because you're reducing that procrastination and that friction, as you've highlighted, it makes it a lot easier to actually have it part of your process because then it becomes a regular thing and it builds into a pattern of behavior, which gives you the benefit. Then when, once you actually do it, you start getting the intrinsic motivation that builds into it. And once you actually get to the gym, it's like, oh, I don't really feel like it today, but I'm already here, so I'll start. And as you start, you actually start getting the motivation and you get the enjoyment or the other aspects of it to actually get to the next stage. It's actually making sure that you remove as much decision-making out of the whole process because obviously you're removing load on your working memory because from all of the research that people are saying is that by removing that amount of decision-making before you have to do something, it just makes process a lot easier and you actually don't feel as fatigued because you're actually leaving that, you could say that with that willpower for the next stage or when you actually do need that energy to make a big decision or you need to actually actively sit down and actually make a decision of which way you've got to use it. And it, as you said, you, you're optimizing your behavior and you're optimizing your resources to actually use it for the right purpose and actually focusing it on the right area. Absolutely. And you, you, you bring up a really interesting um, piece of, of science that we, we we're starting to understand, which is that passion uh, is something that develops out of, of hard work, um, that we don't start with passion. We actually develop passion, and so most people think that all of a sudden, you know, you're gonna you're gonna find your life purpose, or you're gonna find a passion for running, um, and then you're gonna go buy all the gym clothes and start, you know, running every day and so on and so forth. No, if you believe that running is something that you want to do, you will develop a passion after you start actually getting over the initial hurdle of all of the drudgery it takes to start running. As a runner, I know that when I first started running, there was all of this drudgery associated with it. It's tough. It's not easy to go run every day. You're putting, you're pounding uh, pavement and putting your body through um, a, a good bit of, uh, of work. Um, it wasn't until actually several years later that I found myself kind of in that stride, uh, you know, pun intended, that I, I was I was actually passionate about running because I had been running. I was doing yeah. it and I was getting good at it. Uh, and so uh, many years later now, you know, I've been running for most of my life. And uh, now I, I, I feel passionate about running because I'm a runner. Uh, and so uh, these folks who, who think about if they want to be passionate about being um, healthy, uh, you know, healthy eating, having good nutrition, um, having a good uh, physical fitness uh, regimen, those kinds of things. Don't think that you're going to find passion and then do the work. You do the work and then you get the passion. So, uh, so don't, don't think that you have to be passionate about something in order to start something. Um, I, I can't imagine anyone who is passionate about knitting um, until they're actually knitting. Uh, so you know, there's, just a, there's just a reality factor here that I think a lot of people believe that they have to have some kind of out, out, um, uh, you know, enlightenment that comes to them about what they should be doing. And then all of a sudden that enlightenment is going to be that 
uh, thing that motivates them. And in reality, motivation is based on hardship. Motivation is based on challenge and then our social uh, structure. So we will, we will do something because it is challenging to us, not inverse. We won't do something because it's easy. I think that's, um, there, there are obviously processes in place. You know, we, we take the well-worn path and those kinds of things. But when it comes to the things we are thoughtfully trying to do, we will do them because of the challenge associated with it. Um, that is the right amount of challenge. It's like the Goldilocks zone of challenge. Uh, mm-hmm. We will do things because they are the right amount of challenge to us. That we, we know that it's a stretch. We know that we can achieve it um, and, you know, we have a good chance of achieving it um, and that it will be tough. Um, and it's actually that kind of activity that gets us to, to uh, want to do something. Uh, it's the, it's the, um, it's kind of like uh, reverse psychology, right? If I tell you, oh, you can't have this piece of candy, then you really want this piece of candy. Yeah. Uh, that's actually how we always operate. We just don't think about it that way. Um, but the moment we start to think about how to be motivated to do things, um, it's because something is mundane, something is too easy, uh, that it creates boredom. And we know that variability and, um, and, and stretching ourselves in terms of goals um, is how we actually get motivated. So I, 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 again, it just goes back to understanding the underlying science behind some of these things that people tend to get caught up in uh, thinking about the, uh, the conventional wisdom of something as opposed to the, um, the reality of it, which is if you're trying to do something, just uh, add a little bit of game to it. Add a little bit of fun to it by saying, mm-hmm. I'm going to challenge myself to, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of doing this uh, very boring exercise at work, uh, this project that, that takes me, uh, say, 30 minutes, I'm going to try do, to do it in 25 minutes today, right? And you're making it more difficult by, by challenging yourself to get it done faster. Um, but by doing so, you've actually increased the variability with this because it's not the way it normally is and you've increased the challenge associated with it and that of course uh, begets greater motivation you then get into the activity faster you perform uh, at a higher level and you can then start to optimize because now you can say well if i can do this report in 25 minutes could i do it in 20 right and so now you've taken 30 minutes of your day and you've shrunken an activity to 20 and what do you do with that other 10 minutes now is really important and key do you uh, flitter it away? Do you just stare at the ceiling uh, for that extra 10 minutes? Do you use that as an opportunity to do some um, politicking? Are you going to use that time to socialize with, with your coworkers uh, and potentially um, be better liked among your, uh, your, your coworkers? Are you going to use that time to start a side project at the office uh, that's going to be useful to you uh, in, in your next uh, you know, performance review? There are all of these ways in which you can utilize uh, getting better and getting more done uh, by, by utilizing the right uh, ways of thinking about how to get more done and using challenge and motivation in that way uh, to to optimize. Yeah, the the aspect about keep making it interesting and making a challenge ties into states of flow. And obviously, you got um, you know where when it comes to making it challenging and also getting a reward, because as you start doing it and and, and motivation kicks in uh, and you get the 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 benefit of doing something better or faster, you actually get the dopamine, which helps drive further motivation and enjoyment and the, the novelty of doing it slightly different or slightly faster or making it interesting, adding gamification to it, keeps you a lot more focused and a lot more engaged with what you're doing. And it means that you, you get more results out of it because of just changing a factor of it to keep you engage and interested and trying to make make an improvement and it's not an obvious improvement the goal isn't to although the goal is or the end result is to become better or faster more optimized the actual application is to make it fun by making it fun or interesting it automatically becomes better and faster and optimized it's a it's almost like an inverse process of actually getting the getting a better results by by using and doing it that way Absolutely. So it's a, there's there's a there, there's a lot of really interesting, you could say, touch points with with a lot of the the the, the work and the research that I've done, and uh, I think we can we can probably have a, another podcast episode talking about some more specifics. But it's it's been fantastic to to actually get some of your time and get some of your insights on this. I really appreciate it, and it's it's been a pleasure. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've I, I've come across some really good insights on it. So uh, it's it's been well worth uh, 
actually learning from you. Thanks a lot for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Lions. Excellent. Speak to you soon. When you support and review a podcast like this from someone like Lance, it gains more visibility and motivates him to produce more. What topics most interest you? The best topic gains a shout out on the podcast.